Kask, you say and spell your name, please. Sure. My name is Randy White, R-A-N-D-Y-W-H-I-T-E. My title is doctor, and I'm the executive director of the FPU Center for Community Transformation. And my name is Carlos Huerta, C-A-R-L-O-S. H-U-E-R-T-A, and I serve as the Associate Director at the Fresno Pacific University Center for Community Transformation. All right. So uh, tell me a little bit about uh, like the origins of the, the New Skills Initiative, uh, how long it's been in planning, uh, and uh, what you aim to do with it, and when you hope it'll be rolled out. Right, so the Lilly Endowment uh, is, sorry, you okay? There we go. So the Lilly Endowment is one of the nation's largest um, philanthropic organizations that funds faith efforts throughout the country. Um, they'll probably invest $100 million this year. 800 proposals were made for the Thriving Congregations Grant, which is this year's grant. And out of those 800, 92 were accepted. Uh, the Center for Community Transformation, which we refer to as the CCT, applied, and we were one of the 92 to be accepted. The title for our grant was New Skills for a New Era. And the premise of the grant is, especially in Central California, um, we are facing tremendous economic and social challenges that uh, need fresh approaches. And because fresh approaches are necessary, you need new skill sets. You need a toolbox of relevant skills. And these aren't just individual skills. These are institutional skills. Um, sorry, one more time. These aren't just individual skills, these are institutional skills, a new toolbox of skills. And so since our constituency is uh, the faith community throughout the valley, our objective is to equip faith organizations with a new toolbox that will help them train their congregations to focus on their neighborhoods and communities in various uh, ways that um, approach the uh, problems that are most seriously impacting those communities. So um, there are a number of these that are uh, socially related and many others that are economically related. And that may be of, of more interest to the, the Fresno Business Journal. Uh, in, its, in its essence, this is all about igniting the assets of the faith community to address social and economic needs of their neighborhoods and communities. And in this particular case, we're going to do that um, by making training available to uh, faith communities that want to engage, for example, in micro enterprise development. We have many people coming out of uh, prison uh, or others who are uh, struggling economically, especially right now with COVID-19. Uh, you know, thousands and thousands of people have lost their jobs, uh, have found difficulty in getting hiring, uh, but they know how to do something. They have maybe a side hustle and they know how to make something and they can sell something. They've got plenty of drive. They've got plenty of energy and um, entrepreneurial spirit but they don't know the process of starting a small business. So we have now trained teams up and down the valley to uh, help people learn how to start their own micro business or small business to help pay for their family's needs. Um, and we're able to provide now 60 scholarships to these courses up and down the valley uh, to defray the majority of the expense um, of, of these courses. And this provides um, uh, a congregation's ability to say to somebody coming just out of prison, look, we'll help you start your small business. We'll wrap all these other resources around you 
we'll give you an instant customer base uh, for whatever product you're selling or whatever uh, service you're providing. Um, and so faith organizations like churches up and down the valley become kind of a seedbed for this entrepreneurial approach. And this really never existed at this level, uh, marshalling this basic asset of the faith community um, before. This is, this is brand new. Similarly, we're doing this with financial literacy training. And so uh, we began a program a number of years ago called Faith and Finances, which is now being used in Fresno Housing Authority complexes. It's a faith-based system of financial literacy training. Um, we've trained uh, dozens and dozens of facilitators, but it's costly. It's you know, $250 to $400 to train a facilitator. Because of this Lilly grant, uh, we're going to be able to train 60 new facilitators per year for five years. 300 new financial literacy facilitators spread throughout the valley um, at almost no cost to the, the agency. So if a church, for example, wants to provide financial literacy classes in their neighborhood, um, especially neighborhoods that are impacted by unemployment, et cetera, um, they'll be able to provide these uh, and they'll be able to get the training, first of all, at no cost, and then be able to provide them for uh, people that in need in the, in the neighborhoods. So these were just two of several components of the new skills for a new era proposal that we made to Lilly. And um, they'll all roll out uh, in January. And so from now through January or up to January, we're you know, getting all of our ducks in a row and making sure that we've got the right staff and the right structures in place. In, in two of these cases, we've, we've already launched those programs, but the grant will put them on steroids. Uh, so for example, Carlos, do you wanna say a word about what's happening right now with, with our microenterprise training? Absolutely, Randy. Right now we have a microenterprise training, which we call Launch Central Valley. Uh, we're, we currently have 12 different entrepreneurs who are going through this nine week training. Uh, the, the program specifically called Co-Starters. Uh, and so, you know, we have different models, everything from a coffee shop to, uh, you know, a clothing line as well as a baker and chef. You have various different folks who, you know, have been impacted by COVID in, in some way, shape or form uh, and have one, you know, uh, are looking to, to move a side hustle into more of a full-time venture or at the same time scale their operations from something that maybe was, you know, simply providing a, a basic line of income, but they still have another part-time job or, or, or maybe even a full-time job. And so uh, really we're, we're working with entrepreneurs in those nine weeks, as well as signing a business coach uh, to really scale their operations. And so many of these folks, you know, are at the idea phase, uh, you know, let's say half of them have already started generating revenue at this point of the stage, but there, I, I mean, as in most uh, business training programs, you're really looking at, you know, everything from legal to marketing to sales to product development, but really our focus is, is working in an urban context, but also with, I'd say, communities that, that are most disenfranchised. If you will, low to moderate income communities, uh, we need, we'd say also another level of support that they might not have access to otherwise. And so that's all built into our Launch Central Valley program. And so that Launch Central Valley program, we're in a pilot in right now with these 12 entrepreneurs that Carlos just referenced. That is the model we're going to be taking throughout the Valley. And the grant allows us to do that in the South Valley and uh, all the way up to Merced. Uh, and people, um, uh, whether a church or a nonprofit uh, organization or ministry will be able to offer a slot in an upcoming Launch Central Valley course because of the scholarships that the grant is going to provide. You know, and Randy, I'd, I'd also add, you know, our success in social entrepreneurship uh, spurned a, a, almost a need uh, 
it, in our community was, was consistently asking for this because over the last seven years, we specifically invested through our spark tank process, you know, over a hundred thousand dollars in, in 48 different businesses in not simply, you know, affording, you know, a, a, a modest level of capital, but also uh, providing other supports to scale their operations where now, you know, we, we have over a, a 52% uh, success rate in the sense that these businesses are surviving past year one, two, three, and four. Um, and so in that time, you know, we've had many folks who have wanted to start a business who aren't specifically social enterprises, but we didn't really have a mechanism or it's also the infrastructure to pull this off. And so the Lilly Grant has, uh, in a way, afforded that opportunity to, to, again, as Randy has mentioned, build infrastructure in both uh, North Valley, specifically closer to Merced, and in the South Valley in the, in the Hanford Lamore area. Yeah, and the um, social enterprise, I know that you've written about before, Donald, um, our Spark Tank, et cetera. So those are also uh, focused on institutions and, and individuals who want to create a business. But as Carlos has said, the vision for those businesses is that they would become employers of people that have barriers or they would accomplish some social good through the vehicle of business. So that is distinguished from this launch Central Valley um, program that we're, we're launching through the, the grant in that these are just individuals that need to pay for their family's well-being. They just need to generate income revenue for their own families. And so it's really a very different animal. And you mentioned that this isn't a denominational uh, initiative then. It pretty much uh, any type of, uh, yeah. any type of church, whether it's Methodist or Baptist or Catholic, yeah, uh, they would have access to this. Yes, uh, this is non-denominational, um, and you know, the in the case of Launch Central Valley, the curriculum itself is not faith-centered. It's uh, it, it's best practices for launching a small business, and uh, yet those who are presenting the courses often come from perspectives of faith, and. Uh, churches that want to sponsor people through a Launch Central Valley class, of course, they're, they're going to come from their own faith perspective, and we don't control any of that. Um, we think that those are wonderful assets that they're able to bring to the table. Each church or denomination brings something different and special, and we value all of those. And uh, they're able to tailor things, um, you know, the, the support they give to the individual who wants to start a business and uh, the specialized forms of support they're able to give. It's kind of cool too, because many of these churches will have business people that can act as mentors. They'll have an extra room at the back of the church that can be used for storage or, or stock or supply. Um, you know, they wrap, uh, so there, there might even be investors in the church that want to help this person, you know, buy a piece of equipment that they need. So these, Congregations are, are wonderful assets for this, you know, each startup um, and can wrap all, all the, the benefits of faith around that, around that process. But when we teach the class, it's, there's, there is not a uh, spiritual curriculum. I think the other asset we, <clears throat> we also talk about, Randy, are the people in the church, you know, we have over the years from congregations where they have folks, you know, who they want to engage in some way, shape or form in their activities, but they're not really interested in, in serving coffee and they might not be a big fan of children and in, in doing, you know, Sunday school. But when a church says, hey, you know, we, we're starting a, a social business, we're starting a micro enterprise supporting somebody, uh, does anybody have any kind of legal uh, advice they could provide or accounting help? or become a business coach, uh, or even simply have, uh, you know, equipment that you could donate. To. We've seen that catch on really quickly. And that, that same person who maybe was never really engaged in a congregation 
all of a sudden, you know, realize like I absolutely have assets that for my professional life that I can use to, you know, to do good work within our congregation. There is also an educational component to this. So we are going to be running six, six convenings per year uh, for congregations in the valley that just want to learn about their own neighborhoods and their own issues, uh, many of which are economic, especially in, in the COVID era, uh, because churches are also economic engines in neighborhoods. The work of Ram Kanan from the University of Chicago, or is it Philadelphia, um, has demonstrated this. Rom, R-O-M, no, R-A-M, I believe, C-N-A-A-N, Rom Kanan, uh, has done all sorts of research on, on the economic engines that congregations are in cities. Uh, and yet most congregations, most pastors, don't have a sense for their own, for the asset that they are, to a, to a neighborhood. And uh, so we're running equipping seminars. There'll be six in the year 2021 uh, related to the grant that um, help train churches so that they understand their own assets and they understand the economic needs of their communities a little bit better. Even though they've all got business people in their, in their congregations that might understand the economics uh, and and the, the challenges of the Central Valley, often people trained in ministry that they didn't go to business school, they went to a seminary somewhere, and that's not really a subject. So we want congregations and the leaders, both lay leaders and clergy, to learn about their neighborhoods, learn about the economic challenges of the neighborhood. So that's kind of the, there's going to be a backdrop, an educational backdrop to this, but the real meat of this the real meat is that there'll be 60 full scholarships to launch Central Valley from Merced to Tulare. There'll be 60 full scholarships to faith and finances per year from Merced to Tulare. That's 300 people, 300 leaders who will be trained in uh, either microenterprise or financial literacy over the next five years. And that has the chance of making a systemic difference helping these faith organizations take on this new toolbox, this new skill set uh, that can impact their communities, especially where there are financial challenges uh, in those communities. So that's the vision. And, and you know, Lily, the Lily Endowment um, recognized the innovative nature of this. And uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, we were only one of 92 across the country to receive the grant, which is nearly a million dollars over five years. So we call the whole program New Skills for a New Era. And um, we are right now in the development stage for of all the, the materials that you know, you'll eventually see on our website and on um, digital advertising and distributed to all congregations in the Central Valley. You know, there are more than 1,400 uh, uh, congregations in the Central Valley. It's a, it's, it at times has been called a sleeping giant. And, uh, but the, the tremendous asset that those congregations represent to the healing of our communities, uh, if they had the right toolbox, um, they could be doing so much more. And so this is, it's, it's, it's exciting, I think, for that reason. And I, I think the other thing I'd add to that too, Randy, is, you know, we, we hear, you know, one as the, the church as a sleeping giant in, in the economic well-being of our city is that churches, you know, and faith-based organizations really are positioned as trusted institutions in neighborhoods, especially those neighborhoods in, in our 22 concentrated poverty neighborhoods and, and other uh, neighborhoods all across the Central Valley where people turn to help, you know, whether it's maybe for clothing or food or uh, some level of utility assistance. Um, and sometimes, you know, we hear pretty often actually from congregations of what, you know, what can be our, what can our response be beyond charity? Uh, and so we've realized over the years that churches, you know, have the willingness to want to look at other vehicles of, of help beyond charity. 
Uh, we absolutely acknowledge that charity is absolutely needed in our community. This relief aspect, if you will, uh, is very important to the well-being of our neighbors. Um, on the other side, you know, I think congregations also want to know how do we help people in the long term. And so we really feel that our role in this continuum of care, if you will, is to provide resources and training for these congregations to, to essentially build capacity to do development within their, within their neighborhoods. And then that's also uh, a big, I'd say, foundation for new skills for a new era is, is acknowledging that our congregations have a willing desire, but you know, often don't know necessarily what to do, who to turn to, or what resources or what vehicles of transformation are out there. Yeah, for example, in uh, many congregations, you'll hear uh, they'll take their own members through a another financial literacy training um, curriculum that's been marketed throughout churches throughout the United States, but. The curriculum is really designed for middle-class white people. And uh, they'll talk about what to do with a $10,000 investment. Well, in our poorest neighborhoods, uh, $10,000 is a fantasy. Uh, in our poorest neighborhoods, they're trying to figure out how do I escape the payday lender uh, and exploitative uh, practices, predatory lending practices. Uh, there are more payday lenders in our city than McDonald's and Starbucks combined. So, um, and many aren't banked and don't know the benefits of banking. So the faith and finances curriculum that we use was designed for the low and moderate income community. And so they deal with issues that the low and moderate income community routinely has to struggle with. It does the same best practice training as other financial liter literacy curricula, but this particular curriculum deals very, very much with those issues that are being faced in the poorest neighborhoods. And it's delivered in a way that doesn't assume a, a minimum literacy skill, for example, some of, you know, and it, it's, you know, it's not a video series, it's not talking heads, it's uh, it's not a lot of paperwork. It's more interactive, hands-on, it's humor-based. And this recognizes the way adults in low and moderate income communities learn and utilizes that learning method as, a, as an, um, an asset, as an advantage. And so it's, it's uniquely tailored um, to a, an audience to deal with what their issues really are. Um, and that's, that, that would be really new for the Valley to have that all up and down the Valley. Now we've done this for the last several years in Fresno and I mentioned faith and finances is being used right now in housing authority complexes and it's transformational for people. We've got all sorts of stories, uh, coming out of these, um, these financial literacy classes called faith and finances that, um, are liberating for people. They're just able to make better decisions, more informed decisions and avoid some of the pitfalls um, that others uh, in their environment are, are falling, falling into. And so we're really excited about the expansion of that because it'll be a distribution system then throughout the Valley for a very successful financial literacy program designed for low and moderate income people. You know, Randy, and the other thing along with the stories that you mentioned is some of the, the data too that we co collect and understanding some of the outputs that are key to developing the outcomes we're looking for, specifically tied to, you know, to the ex to, to starving the exploitative practices of payday lenders. I mean, over the last four years, we've been able to uh, to have 343 people complete our faith and finances program, and part of what we're we're tracking are indicators of change. Everything from you know seeing 71% of those uh, you know participants now tracking their income and expenses. You know we see understanding what kind of assets they are and what kind of assets they acquire. Over 90% indicate that you know they have a better understanding of what their assets are. Um, you know and there's some other like core foundational things like understanding the differences between a need and a want. Um, and sometimes that can be blurred, especially in a consumeristic society. Um, and I think some of my favorite 
you know, data points here would be that 82% have short-term savings goals and have started saving towards them. 59% have long-term savings goals. This would be, a, you know, a, a short-term goal between two to three hundred dollars, uh, and a long-term savings goals of of over five hundred dollars. Um, and then ultimately, we see that, you know, in through the course, uh, sixty-nine percent of those participants have also paid off a payday loan as they've built uh, a spending plan, right? And so again, I think we're we're looking at tackling what we would call bad debt, you know. A, a, we, we acknowledge payday lenders provide a, a needed service, if you will, uh, for emergencies. But the reality is payday lenders follow the corridors of poverty uh, and exploit communities to use these services for things that aren't necessarily an emergency. And that's where uh, communities often get trapped. Uh, and so I think that's where we find a, a big strength in our financial literacy program both the stories as well as the data points. Yeah, so what that means, Donald, is that at the start of every one of these financial literacy courses, they take a, they take a, um, a kind of like a, a, a test that answers these questions. How many of you have a, you know, how, how, do you have a savings program right now? Um, uh, you know, do you know what insurance is for? Uh, it's a set of benchmark questions. And then they take the same test at the end. And so we were able to see and track this progress of how many now have paid off debt, how many now have paid off um, you know, their, their payday loans, how many have a savings account, et cetera. Um, I also want to circle back to talk about, you know, I mentioned this number of 60 scholarships to faith and finance facilitator training. Now this is facilitator training. What that means is that Every year, 60 facilitators will be trained for five years, 300 facilitators. What does that mean? It means if you train 300 facilitators and those 300 facilitators lead a class of 10 to 15 people, think about how many tens of thousands of people you're training in financial literacy throughout Central California. That's, that's remarkable influence. And over time that builds. And so we're really, uh, we're looking to the, the way that the grant is helping us take these things to scale and add another tool in the toolbox of congregations that are embedded in some of the poorest neighborhoods of our valley and uh, being able to influence. I mean, I would love to see payday lenders go out of business in some neighborhood because nobody in the neighborhood wants to go there anymore. And I think there's that potential with this, this approach. Absolutely. Uh, how many churches have, uh, have applied so far? We haven't put the information out yet. Uh, we just got notified, uh, was it two weeks ago, Carlos, a week and a half ago, <laughs> that Correct. we got the grant. So, um, but we've, you know, in faith and finances, we've, we've had dozens of churches that have already been trained over the last few years. And I'm sure we can look that up and get that number to you. Um, it's over 35 of, churches, Randy. Okay. I can get an exact number for Donald. Yeah. And so Launch Central Valley, we just are finishing our first uh, pilot cohort. Uh, we're, I not say finishing, we're halfway through. So uh, and we have 12 people um, in that one. But our goal is to train, uh, you know, we've, we've already trained three teams of facilitators, one in Merced, one in Fresno, and one in Hanford. The Fresno team has launched already the first cohort, and that's the pilot one we're talking about. And then we're hopeful that Hanford and Merced will launch um, after the first of the year. Um, and being able to spread these 60 scholarship slots out in Launch Central Valley will help. Um, we haven't even talked about the possibility we could actually train more teams of facilitators for Launch Central Valley. That is a possibility as well uh, down the road uh, if these pilots go well. So um, all of these things officially start up in January. Uh, you know, we'll publish a schedule of all of the equipping seminars. Uh, 
in close, probably mid-December. And then um, if churches, you know, start hearing about it, uh, right, even right now, or once our materials are published, if they get wind, uh, then they can simply contact us through the CCT website or the office and, uh, and let us know that they're interested in this training. I think the thing is with, with just 60 scholarships each, I think we're gonna hit our limit um, because that's what the grant will fund. And, um, and then we'll uh, create waiting lists for the following, for, for the next training opportunity. Um, so this is a five year process. And I think um, whether you, you get to be first in line or 10th in line, um, we'll be able to get to you as a, a congregation that wants this uh, kind of training. Uh, interestingly, individuals can just sign up too. So um, we, we really like it better when uh, an institution sends somebody and says, hey, this is a person in our congregation. They've got a vision for a business. They want to start one because we think that they're going to have better support systems around them. Um, but we will welcome anyone who wants essential training in how to start a small business. So um, um, people just need to contact us via our website or our, our office, main office. Uh, well, thank you very much, both of you.